Brian Lehrer on WNYC as the crowd here at the Green Space laughs to Mo Rocca dancing to the Brian Lehrer show theme. Love the theme. At least bopping in his chair. And by the way, listeners, um, for those of you listening to the show today and thinking, that sounds cool being in the Green Space to watch the show one day, we do it once a month in the Green Space. And you can already buy tickets for the next one, which will be one month from today. So that will be Wednesday, March 13th at WNYC.org slash events or slash the green space uh, just so you know that they're available early. Can so, I ask, by the way, is the green space part of the Green New Deal? Because <laughs> if it is, I'm all in. I, I'm going to have to talk to our sustainability officer and find out. So when Mo Rocca writes an obituary, what do you call it? A mobituary, obviously. And you public radio listeners know Mo Rocca from Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. And he's also a CBS News Sunday morning correspondent and other things. And yes, his new podcast series is called Mobituary. So please welcome Mo Rocca to the Green Thank you very Space. much. I'm so happy to be here. And what's the difference between an obituary and a mobituary? Well, a mobituary is for someone who didn't get a proper send-off the first time around, or really any send-off at all in some cases. So it could be um, anyone from Audrey Hepburn, who in a way had the misfortune of not only dying way too early, but dying on the same day as Bill Clinton's inaugural, so she got pushed off the front page. Or someone like Elizabeth Jennings, who was um, kind of Rosa Parks, 101 years before Rosa Parks, right here in New York City. Um, sued a uh, railroad company for being kicked off of a streetcar, and it led to the integration of New York City's transportation system. But who remembers Elizabeth Jennings? Exactly. So she needs. So she deserves more than a mobituary. She deserves a statue and a lot else. Um, Audrey Hepburn, the actress whose obituary, surprisingly, you tell us, didn't even make the front page of the New York Dance. Times. So here is a clip from the podcast in which Mo, and he kind of gave away the spoiler here, speaks to Bill Clinton about this coincidence. <laughs> Were you aware that the day of your inauguration, Audrey Hepburn died? No. You didn't know that? No. You did not know it that? Didn't re- look, I didn't, it was a fairly busy time. I didn't sleep for two days. <laughs> Understandably, he'd been a little distracted. So to jog his memory, I brought along an old copy of the New York Times. She was only 63, yeah, I remember that. I remember how young I thought she was. I didn't think about it being my inaugural day. Yeah, and she's like, she, they, they put her back here. But it's a nice spread. She was amazing, I loved her. I loved Roman Holiday, I loved Funny Face, Sabrina, I loved Breakfast funny at Tiffany's. Funny Face so great. I loved Sabrina. I like the remake because I like the first one so much. Mm, that may be pushing it. <laughs> Did you know, besides the coincidence of the date, that he was such a fan? I didn't know that. I didn't know that at all. Um, but I actually remember I was um, living in New York already that day, and I remember passing by a kiosk, seeing newspapers there, and seeing that Audrey Hepburn was in the little reefer, what they call little reefer box, at the bottom of the front page. And I, re- I remember that back in 1993 and thinking, Wow, what an odd coincidence. And so um, it's the kind of thing that keeps me up at night. And she wasn't even probably the most popular actor with the last name Hepburn. No, she wasn't. And it was actually very funny in that episode of the podcast that Karen James, the writer for The New York Times, has only written two obituaries, Catherine Hepburn's and Audrey Hepburn's. So The Times has a chief Hepburn obituarist, (laughs) apparently. (laughs) And we should say, you didn't choose Audrey Hepburn because she was literally pushed off the front page. You explore why she's still so popular today, and you make the case that people connect to Audrey Hepburn because of the trauma of her childhood, which came through in her acting. Would you talk about that? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it, it is uh, at heart a history podcast. I'm a big history buff. Um, and I should say that I was working at Macy's as, um, behind the fragrance counter in 1992 when I first came to New York. I was not a spritzer. Those are the people, the male models in front of the counter. I was behind the counter sort of casting out my reel with the male model as the lure 
I think that's right. I'm not really a fisherman, as you can tell. Uh, but anyway, I noticed that when she walked by my counter one day, I mean, it was a magical moment. Even if cell phones had existed back then, we would not have shoved our hands in front of her face for a selfie. Everything kind of stopped. And, and now she's been gone for more than and a quarter of a century. And as you said, I wanted to sort of explore why she still has this hold, why she still trends on Twitter. And so we looked at her war years. We talked um, to both of her sons, and we hypothesize in this that um, what she went through in the war, she nearly starved to death when the Nazis had blockaded where she lived in Holland. Um, She raised money uh, uh, for the resistance. Um, And there's a certain kind of gratitude and empathy that comes through on screen. There were other actresses of that era that were as beautiful and as stylish, but we don't remember them. There's something that's punching through the screen, and and I think that comes from that personal experience. And some people might be surprised to find out that Audrey Hepburn felt a kinship with Anne Frank, right. and you found a clip of her talking about this on CBS in 1989. I read the diary in Dutch, in galley form, when it was still being edited. And it was one of the most devastating experiences I've ever had, because more than just reading a book, it was like having the whole war played back to me. She obviously was locked up inside. I was outside. And here was somebody who had been able to put on paper everything I'd felt during those years, and it was It destroyed me, I must say, and it has stayed an extremely emotional experience Mm -hmm. for me. So that clip from the segment on Audrey Hepburn from Maraca's new series, Mobituaries. Um, And one thing that's really interesting about these Mobits is that they're not just about real dead people. You even grapple with the deaths of fictional characters. One episode is dedicated entirely to sitcom characters. Right. I've always been um, haunted by the sitcom Stasi, that sort of invisible secret police that comes and takes away sitcom characters without any explanation. And I think many of the people here in this audience are probably still reeling from the effects of the two Darrens on Bewitched. <laughs> that, and, and to make it even more haunting, the sitcom Stasi thought they could pull one over on us by replacing Dick York with Dick Sargent and thinking, okay, you... <laughs> You know, they're both named Dick. Um, But one was clearly better than the other. Uh, And it was interesting. There's a, 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 we talked to Lila Garrett, um, who is a a writer, one of the few women who was writing in television back then. And she explained that because the second Darren had less chemistry with Samantha, Elizabeth Montgomery, who played a witch on Bewitched, um, that it threw off the balance of the show. And so you had to have the wonderful ancillary characters like Paul Land and Agnes Moorhead take on more of the comedy. We love those characters, but it was like this, the, my guest for that episode, Alan Seppenwall, TV critic, said it was kind of like the side dishes became the entree. Um, so, and I talked to Henry Winkler about the Chuck Cunningham syndrome. Some people re- may remember, um, perhaps you've repressed it, that on Happy Days, <laughs> Ron Howard's character, Richie Cunningham, had an older brother for the first two seasons. He basically walked through the scene, dribbling a basketball, eating a sandwich. And as the Fonz became more popular, um, it made sense. Gary Marshall, the very smart show creator, said, well, he's really the older brother. I mean, Richie Cunningham's going to go to the Fonz for advice on girls and things like that. So um, Chuck Cunningham had to be disappeared. There was just no two ways. And you can't kill the character since it's a sitcom. Did they write him out, or did he just stop no, being just there? Psh, yeah, like, like, <laughs> right. And in that episode, you point out that characters don't usually die in sitcoms, unlike, say, characters in Law and Order or right. Game of Thrones. Right, right. I think on uh, Game of Thrones, it's about a 76% kill rate. Like, the characters <laughs> die that much. And I died on Law and Order, Criminal Intent, uh, and um, I blew up in a car in the first five minutes. But the residual is still the same, so that's okay. <laughs> um, but we, we did, did talk to the fabulous son, Sandy Duncan, um, and she replaced Valerie Harper, some people may remember from In the Very, with all due respect, mediocre 1990 sitcom Valerie. Uh, Valerie Harper wanted more money, so they actually killed her character, so she died on the show. So that's, that was – so we explored different kinds of sitcom deaths. And do you think we mourn – 
symbolic losses like entertainment losses in some of the same ways that we would mourn a real life loved one, not to trivialize real life mourning, but I think we see it in people's reactions to final episodes of shows they love going off the air, things like that. Oh, sure. I was I was sorry to see Miss Ellie go on Dallas, but she had a good life. Um, <laughs> the uh, uh, yeah, I think a lot of people do. I mean, remember, I mean, the, the last episode of MASH, for heaven's sake. So, And he, I should say Henry Blake dying. And what made it even worse is that he went on to do the sitcom Hello, Larry. Bad move. <laughs> My guest is Mo Rocca. His new uh, podcast series is called Mo Bituaries. And, can I tell you, a friend yes, of mine heard please. Mo Bituaries and said, so is this just stuff that you complain about? <laughs> <laughs> is was... this just an hour of you complaining? And I said, No. <laughs> I was looking to see if the TCH was in the spelling, <clears throat> but it wasn't. But the first episode of the series is on a comic named Vaughn Meter. Anybody here know that name? Raise your hands. Yes. Um, probably those of a certain age um, who people might remember was a wildly popular impersonator of President Kennedy. So we're going to play a clip in a minute, but um, was Meter a controversial figure at the time? Meter was surprisingly a controversial figure in the first family album, which was a sensation for a long time, the highest sounding comedy album of all time. Uh, and while uh, Kennedy was president, yes, right? I mean, while it sold more, I think in a few weeks than My Fair Lady had sold in years, um, it, it, it was extraordinary. And when you go back and listen to it, you can hear it on YouTube. The whole thing—it's about a half hour long. It's like a gentle spoof of the Kennedy family. It's very affectionate. But what we what we found when we went and did this episode is it wasn't just about the death of a man's career. Von Meter, whose career essentially died on November 22nd, 1963, but it was also about the death of a certain kind of political comedy, something, you know, I mean, it was what was really fascinating, Jack Parr introducing Von Meter at the height of his success, you know, he's just going to come on, he's going to do a JFK impersonation. It's, again, it's very affectionate, but Jack Parr essentially apologizes ahead of time and says, I realize this is a little edgy. Um, my, my goodness, how times have changed. And, and I'm not, and by the way, I'm not saying we should go back to that time, but one thing I'm hoping to do with this series is kind of memorialize a time, not just a person. I, I think Colin Jost was just last weekend apologizing before Alec Baldwin came on to play Donald Trump. Kidding. But <laughs> did Kennedy ever react to Mo, Mo, uh, Vaughn Meter? Did they care? Uh, it, it, Kennedy in a press conference, and we included it in the episode, did kind of, he was sort of good humored about it. He said he thought that Von Meter sounded more like Teddy. Um, and so he seemed to handle it well. Jackie Kennedy did not like it. And she was kind of humorless about it. She thought that she couldn't believe that this was happening. And again, if you hear the episode and, and want to hear the album again, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's gentle. But the point yeah. here, I think, from an obituary standpoint yeah. is when the real John F. Kennedy was assassinated, poof, there went Vaughn Meter's career. I mean, it's, look, t comedians are tortured as it is, and for this to happen, I mean, it's almost like Greek myth proportions of tragedy, and obviously he didn't biologically die, but almost symbolically, it, it feels like um, Vaughn Meter lived for another 40 years and kind of wandering through the desert, and, and, you know, part of what was so interesting about doing this episode was hearing from the man himself in the CBS News archives, there was an almost entirely unaired 90-minute interview. Can I play? The, I have a yeah, minute yeah, please, of it. Please. Should I play it, or do you want to set it up further? I, I can set it up. I can set it up further. And it was and, – and so this interview, our, one of our great producers, Megan Marcus, found this interview in the CBS archives, 90 minutes of him shortly before his death – really talking about what it was like to be treated as dead when you're still alive. Because and, people didn't want to look at him. And so this is the last time that Vaughn Meter publicly did his JFK impersonation from this 1998 sit-down on CBS. 200 years ago in Concord, Massachusetts, a uh, shot was fired that was heard around the world. 30-something years ago in Dallas, Texas, Another shot was fired that was heard around the world. The uh, first bullet fired from the uh, Concord Bridge signaled the birth of the American spirit. The uh, second bullet fired from the uh, Texas Book Depository attempted to win that spirit 
and we have seen in the last 30 something years how nearly successful that second bullet was. But in the final analysis, there is no bullet, there is no bomb, there is no power on the face of this earth that can destroy the American spirit. Maybe it'd say something like that, I don't know. Well, you know, I didn't realize until just now the second time I heard that clip that he must have been asked what might have John Kennedy said about his own assassination. That's exactly what it was. A young producer way back in 1998 went down and found him in Florida, interviewed him, and then at the end asked him, and Von Meter says he had not imitated Kennedy for a very long time, but asked what he might say now as Kennedy, that's what he came up with. He didn't come up with a cheap joke, and I, and, I mean, it's, it's harrowing and poignant. Mm. Let me touch um, on your episode called Forgotten Forerunners, yeah. and you gave us a preview of this before, talking about Elizabeth Jennings, a civil rights pioneer, a <clears throat> hundred years before Rosa Parks, um, and there was, uh, well, give, give, us, give us a sense of, of a case, the case around that with the future president, Chester Allen. Sure. Arthur. I'm a big presidential history buff, and I really like the obscure presidents, the ones all between Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt with all the facial hair. Usually they live in Ohio. A couple of them were knocked <laughs> off. We, um, it, it, they've got great mutton chops. And I was reading about Chester Allen Arthur, who I should say was not from Ohio, but anyway, he. Um, I was reading a trivia book about um, these presidents, and it said that he had represented a woman, an African American woman named Elizabeth Jennings, in 1854 um, when she was kicked off a streetcar in Lower Manhattan. Um, on she was on her way to church, uh, and she physically fought to get back on, and eventually. Um, uh, uh, they forcibly, they just threw her into the street, um, and the streets were disgusting then. If you've ever seen Gangs of New York, it's that area of the five points. And we've got 30 seconds left in yep. the show. Go okay. ahead. Oh, are you, is there a clip? I'm giving... Oh, okay. no, we, no. There there's is. the time for questions? <laughs> I love questions. Can't we just go another hour? You're Who's gonna next? You're going to have to come back. <clears throat> we're going to... Uh, sorry, Allison, you don't get to do your show today. Mo Rocca wants to take questions. <laughs> we will have to leave it there. Uh, with I know it's Mo really Rocca. lousy. Uh, you know I love coming here. Mobituaries. Yes. Well, I was going to take the time to say that. Uh, correspondent for CBS Sunday Morning, panelist on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. His new podcast series, Mobituaries, is about the history of people and things that have disappeared get, but continue to intrigue him. What's the next one up? Sammy Davis Jr. And uh, uh, Sammy Davis Jr., we're dropping, as the kids say, this Friday, greatest entertainer of the 20th century. Wherever you get your podcasts. Audience, thank you so much for coming to the Green Space. Thank today. you, Brian. I love Mo talking Rocket. to you. Thank you so much, Brian Lara of WNYC. Thanks, everybody, for listening today. <laughs>